Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry, big mistake there. I'm not the deputy chairman. I am indeed the deputy leader, or at least I was before lunchtime. So I. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's been so many you changes saw? today. You weren't supposed to be mine. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I'm terribly sorry this morning, as you uh, might have heard. I, ha I was delayed by the uh, train journey. So I believe that the great Flo Lewis stood in and did. we swapped places and she spoke in my slot. So thank you very much, Flo. I'm sure it was great. Um, I will actually take you out on a proper date. Uh, I don't think either of us are going to get very far with each other, but <laughs> always worth a try. Um, um, I've been doing quite a lot of media lately, and, and the thing that they're always asking is, what is the point of UKIP? What is the point of UKIP? Uh, we've heard this pretty much our whole recent history, haven't we? From the time when we originally managed to get Cameron to give us a referendum. Then it was, what's the point of UKIP? Um, and here we are, you know, two, three years later, and they're asking the same thing. They desperately want us to go, uh, but we're not actually going to go anywhere. Uh, and the fact is, is that if you look at what we are faced with in the coming two years or so, we are needed more than ever. And it's not a question just of flattering ourselves about that. Paul Nuttall, our great new leader, came up with a great phrase for it, which he used in Stoke, which is basically that we have got to be the backbone of Brexit. And that is exactly what we've got to be. In particular, I would say we have got to retain and absolutely never stop talking about the issue of migration. I don't know whether you saw today, ladies and gentlemen, in the uh, papers, but it's actually now estimated that our population is going to go up to about 70 million within the foreseeable future. I mean, not just like in the distant future. This is completely insane. Now, you heard from David Curtin this morning, the education spokesman. Well, David and I, were, we were elected to the London Assembly uh, last May. It's great for us to be on the Assembly, but I think he'd agree that half of the problems that we find ourselves discussing on the London Assembly, whether it be housing, whether it be transport, whether it, it be pressure on hospitals and social services, all of these things actually are proxy issues for uncontrolled migration. And you find that all over the country, when you are having to have, basically, discussions or argue about these points, you sort of think, I don't want to keep coming back to the subject, but you can't help it, because this is common sense. You know, if you have uncontrolled migration, then you are going to have an uh, absolutely inadequate housing stock. You are going to have shocking congestion on our transport system. You are going to have problems with health and social services and the pressure on those vital services. So we must not stop talking about this because my sense is, is that we are being gotten used to a kind of new normal where each time the immigration statistics come out, it's something like 300,000, 330,000. This happens every time they come out now. People are being made to get used to this amount. And even this week, David Davis said that EU migration might actually have to go on for quite a while. You have not, not even heard, exactly, you have not heard from the Tories, for example, any of their plans about migration, any of their plans about migration. This is extremely worrying. So even though Brexit might actually have been negotiated within two years, fact is it might well be a long time before we get proper control of our borders. So we must stick to it and say that we are the party that wants an Australian-style point system 
It is the one that everybody in this country thinks obviously is the most reasonable and common sense system. And that is our, that is our view and that is our issue. And we must retain it and we must keep talking about it. What I would also say to you is this, is that when it comes to the uh, uh, Australian style point system, we must also say that it's not just a case of your aptitudes and skills, it's also got to be about your attitudes and whether you take on our values as a country. So Brexit is a very, very important issue for us, but we all know that the fact is we can't just be, if you like, as a proper political party, as the third party in this country now, we cannot just be the Jiminy Cricket on the shoulder of the government. We are more than that. We are much more than that. We must have other functions. We must have other goals. Now, I'm culture spokesman. I'm very pleased to be given that brief. I've been talking about it for about three years now. We define culture in UKIP quite widely. It's not just about the Arts Council and opera and ballet and things like that. It's about British culture. And I believe that the most important issues of our time are indeed cultural ones. I think that the biggest existential threat that we face at the moment is from radical Islamism. Do you know, when often you're in these uh, well-lit studios talking about these issues, and I've done lots of debates along these lines about this particular issue, people say, well, you know, you talk about radical Islam, Peter, but uh, don't you realize when you're talking about letting refugees into Britain, you can't tar people with the same brush, and of course you can't. But at the same time, they say, well, do you not realize that the attacks that have happened on Britain whether it be 7-7 or the merge of Lee Rigby, do you not realize that these things are actually homegrown? Well, yes, that's true, they are homegrown. But then, what kind of a country would add to the risk by bringing in the possibility of more terror from outside? It doesn't make sense. No country that wants to survive behaves in that way. And more than anything, like you, ladies and gentlemen, I want our country to survive. Now, one of the reasons that there has been this kind of homebred radical Islam, I would say, is because of the doctrine of multiculturalism. Now, exactly. A lot of people still don't understand the difference. There's a massive difference. We are a multi-ethnic society, right? I want an overarching sense of British values and British identity that everyone can sign up to, whatever, their creed, colour, race, whatever. And that's always been our position, but that was not what multiculturalism was. Multiculturalism was about separation. It was basically saying, you can keep your own culture, you can even keep your own language. You don't have to integrate with us because frankly, you know, we're pretty awful, actually, you know. We've got years of guilt, we're terrible. You know, we don't, we, don't, we don't expect you to want to be one of us. Huge error, huge error. And it's been going on as public policy now for decades. Angela Merkel has said it's wrong. Even David Cameron, in one of his more candid moments, said it's wrong. Trevor Phillips, who is, was the head of the Commission for Racial Equality, also said it was a big mistake. Everyone's saying it. Nobody's doing anything about it. We must be the party that really challenges multiculturalism where it's become embedded as a doctrine at local level and national level. We must fight for a proper multi-ethnic society which is completely united under British values and with loyalty to Britain. And there are a few things I would add to that. Basically, our values, our very basic values. I talk about British values and being loyal to them. People say, what are British values? They say it almost like they don't want them to be values. Well, there are. Free speech is the first one. Free speech. 
We're now living in an era where people really genuinely do not seem to know what they can and cannot say. This is extremely worrying because you don't have to have laws in order to control that. You can actually do it culturally. Uh, you can create a certain atmosphere where people are very, very uncertain. But I would say this to you, that it's fundamental to our culture that we should be able to criticize any belief system. We should be able to mock it if we so wish. It has been part of our historical tradition and it is fading. And I am extremely worried about that. We must be the party to stand up for free speech because the other parties are too cowardly to do it. I do not want to live in a country where basically a young, rather callow, Olympic champion messes about on YouTube and then suddenly finds that he's got a trial by media and possibly see his career actually damaged, right? The law didn't get involved there. It didn't have to. It was about cultural atmosphere. This is extremely worrying. And I would say this to you too, that we must not live in a country where there is an unofficial blasphemy law. We must be able to criticize as much as we want. <laughs> Similarly, when it comes to our values, there is British law. British law is supreme. It is amazing that we're actually having to say this sort of thing in 2017, but we are. British law and the integrity of our legal system must remain intact and must remain supreme. We must, at every opportunity, oppose the growth of competing systems. We must oppose the growth of Sharia law in Britain. And also, look, as a society, what is one of the most fundamental things that we do? We communicate by looking at each other. We communicate by summing each other up, by trying to work out the nuance of expression. That's how we communicate. It's at the very, very basis. So is it really too much to ask that you should show your face in a public space? I would say all of these things because people say, what is UKIP for? These are all the things that we are for. These are tra traditional British values, which I feel are going to become more and more political issues. That might be regrettable, but that is the way things are going at the moment. And I think this is where we have always shown amazing courage. Just only remember about 10 years ago, if just 10 years ago, if you had said that you wanted to come out of the EU, you were virtually certifiable. <laughs> Don't you remember that? I do. You were kind of like the crazy person. You were right out on a limb, right? Well, that is now the center ground of British politics, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. We did that. And all the issues I'm talking about this morning, again, are going to become ones where we are at the common sense center. So finally, also, I'd like to say this. This is a very hard one. It's a very tough one because it's very hard to put into policy. But, you know, since I can remember, I'm 56, since I can remember, I'm sure most of you here too, there has been what can only be described as kind of form of gradual deconstructionism going on with British culture. So basically, from about the post-war period, all of our institutions appear sometimes to give the benefit of the doubt to people who are our enemies, who somehow or other claim we are not who we say we are, who deconstruct our history, who attack, chip away, all of these things. This has left a real sense of powerlessness and indeed has left us with an elite who essentially are not going to stand up for these values. It is one of our most important functions as a party to stand up for our values, to stand up for British identity. I would like to see a Union Jack and a picture of the Queen in every school in Britain. Because it's at schools where this sort of thing starts. 
So we've got a huge, huge mission on our hands, but please, we've proved so strong and enduring. And I'm very exciting, I'm very excited that we actually have what I believe will be an even more important second act. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Now that was some warm-up act. <laughs> I think I've earned my fee. Uh, I didn't have a fee, don't worry. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure as well now to uh, introduce you to somebody who I've known in UKIP since I've been in UKIP, but I've got to know particularly recently, been out canvassing with him, seen him interacting with voters, and what an extraordinarily modest man as well he is. Uh, I believe that we are incredibly lucky to have him as our new leader. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please do give a warm welcome to Paul Nuttall. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. Is everyone having a good day? And by the way, I must say, what a fantastic choice Peter Whittle was as my deputy. I think he's absolutely fantastic. It's great to be back here in the Southwest, uh, which has really been the centre or the heart of Euroscepticism uh, for many many years. Indeed, it's been uh, the very beating heart of UKIP, and I've been a regular visitor over the years. I've spoken uh, on numerous occasions within the region, uh, whether that's been at the national conferences in Turkey or your regional conferences in Turkey, and it's great to be here in Weymouth today. I'm going to start by taking on the elephant in the room. It's been a difficult few weeks for UKIP in the media. Uh, the Stoke by-election uh, was a bruising experience uh, for me personally uh, and indeed uh, for the party. We, <laughs> we did not get the result that we wanted. Uh, we went in to the by-election and we knew we were never the favourites to take the seat. Uh, in fact, the bookies always had us behind, uh, but we thought that we could cl uh, claw that 5,000 Labour majority back. The campaign also wasn't perfect. But let's put this into perspective. We cut Labour's majority in half. We finished second. We forced two Remain candidates, the Labour Party candidate and the Conservative Party candidate, who are both backed Remain prior to the referendum. They came out for Brexit during the by-election. So although we did not win the seat, we certainly set the agenda. But the underlying problem, and the real reason that we did not win, is because the Tory vote did not come to us in the numbers that we expected. It did not budge. And with hindsight, that shouldn't have surprised us. Because Theresa May is going through probably the longest honeymoon period in modern politics because she's very good and always has been at talking the talk and indeed if you look or listen to her speeches recently she could be giving those speeches at a UKIP national conference <laughs> but the one thing that we know with Theresa May is that she's never very good at walking the walk her time as Home Tech Secretary should tell us this. Simply ask the Police Federation. Look at her position when it came to tackling radical Islam. Look at her record on immigration. She was the Home Secretary that told us 
we would get immigration figures down to the tens of thousands. In here last year, as Home Secretary, a city the size of Newcastle upon Tyne came to this country. 335,000 people net. It is not good enough. The proof is in the pudding. And I predict, once Article 50 is invoked, and the talking the talk stops, and the walking the walk begins, Theresa May will fail once again. And this is why it is so important that UKIP is strong. We must be the guard dogs of Brexit. We must ensure that Brexit really does mean exit. And we must hold the government's feet to the fire. And we must say to them, if you barter away our fisheries, we will be there. If you backslide on a membership fee, we will be there. And if you try to wriggle out of doing away with freedom of movement, UKIP will be there. It is clear to me, as clear as night follows day, that Theresa May will backslide, that politics will return to our turf in the coming months. But for now, UKIP needs to stay on the pitch to reap the rewards. We need to hold our nerve. Now is not the time for panic or knee-jerk reactions, and now certainly isn't the time for navel-gazing or infighting. Yeah. Now is the time for cool heads, for forward thinking and careful planning. We have a large but not insurmountable task ahead. Please remember, when I took over this party, on November the 28th, it resembled a jigsaw that had been tipped onto the floor. We started the process of putting it back together. And over the coming months, we will continue to do so. Internally, there will be constitutional reform on the table, a major reorganisation of regional structures and a fresh rebrand for a new era. The party will also be working on a new policy platform. And I want to make this absolutely crystal clear for everyone, not just in this room, but those watching online as well. Under my leadership of UKIP, UKIP will lose none of its radicalism. It will remain a radical political party. There will be no rush to a clustered centre of British politics. We will continue to talk about the issues that the other parties either neglect or don't want to talk about. We will push not only for an Australian points-based system, but also an aptitudes and attitudes test. So if, for example, you think FGM is okay, you're not coming into this country. If you think... If you think honour violence is okay, you are not coming into this country. If you think forced marriage is okay, you are not coming into this country. People should sign up to British values and the British rule of law. We will continue to talk about the ring-fenced foreign aid budget. We will slash it. It's bloated. It's a disgrace, actually. And we will reinvest that money back into the NHS because we in UKIP are never ashamed to say that charity begins at home. We will also campaign for a new council house building programme so working people can have affordable 
rents. And we will also ensure that the 7,000 veterans that slept rough last night have a roof over their heads. Many more new radical policies will be fleshed out over the coming months and the summer and will be announced at the annual conference in the autumn. I've read this week in many news outlets that UKIP is in crisis. Well, I'm an old hand at this. Many of, many of you have known me for many years in the party. In fact, I've been a member for 13 years years. And I've read UKIP's obituary. It must be over a hundred occasions. And we've always come back. We're a bit like a boomerang, aren't we? You throw us away and we always come back. And we always come back stronger than before. Is this really a crisis that we're in now? I remember the real crisis that we went through back in 2006 to 2008. It was a time when we weren't even appearing in opinion polls because we were below 1%. It was when we didn't have even one single councillor across the country. It was when membership had fallen to about 13,000 and was going down every single month. It was when we were regularly losing our deposits at by-elections. Well, let's put this crisis into perspective. Last weekend, we were 15% in the polls. That's up on when I took over as leader. We've stood in three parliamentary by-elections since I became leader. We have finished second in two. Membership is also holding steady. We have 500 councillors working hard across the country. We have over 20 MEPs. We have an MP in Parliament. We have nine AMs working hard in the assemblies. This is not a party in crisis. This is a party which is on the move and looking to the future. And by the way, since I arrived back from my break after the Stoke by-election, I have come back to a commitment from a consortium of the party's biggest donors, led by Alan Bowen and Stuart Wheeler, who have gave a commitment that the party will be financially secure for the foreseeable future. Last November, I was elected with the biggest mandate ever received in this party. My call for unity in November resonated then, as I'm sure it resonates now with our membership. And I want to make one thing perfectly clear. Bringing people together and asking for unity is not a sign of weakness. Bringing people together to look to the future, to work hard for this party is a sign of strength. We have a big set of elections coming up in May and history teaches us that people do not go out and vote for divided parties. So therefore we have a duty to come together and to work together for the greater good, not only for our party, but also for the country as a whole. So, colleagues, friends, UKIP brothers and sisters, the future is bright. We have a Tory party, which I am convinced will begin to barter away and backslide on Brexit. We have a Labour party led by a man who refuses to sing the national anthem that wants to give the Falklands back to Argentina. We have a shadow chancellor who had said things about nice things about the ira we have had a shadow home secretary who seems to think that mentioning brexit is somehow racist they will let down working class people in the future and both the tories and the labor party must be aware that a strong professional united ukip will be there 
to hoover up their votes in the future. We must get ready, ladies and gentlemen. We must come together. We must plan. We must professionalise because the future really is bright for our party. Now, there's been many a doomsayer this week. Many people have asked questions about the future of UKIP and what it will stand for. Well, let me just say this. We are a radical political movement. Our membership is still way above 30,000. This membership will grow when politics comes back onto our turf. All we have to do is to hold our nerve, stay on the pitch, stay in the game, stop the infighting, and the future is bright, the future is purple. Thank you very much. problems that we find ourselves discussing on the London Assembly, whether it be housing, whether it be transport, whether it, it be pressure on hospitals and social services, all of these things actually are proxy issues for uncontrolled migration. And you find that all over the country when you are having to have basically discussions or argue about these points, you sort of think, I don't want to keep coming back to the subject, but you can't help it, because this is common sense. You know, if you have uncontrolled migration, then you are going to have an uh, absolutely inadequate housing stock. You are going to have shocking congestion on our transport system. You are going to have problems with health and social services and the pressure on those vital services. So we must not stop talking about this because my sense is, is that we are being gotten used to a kind of new normal where each time the immigration statistics come out, it's something like 300,000, 330,000. This happens every time they come out now. People are being made to get used to this amount. And even this week, David Davis said that EU migration might actually have to go on for quite a while. You have not, not even heard, exactly, you have not heard from the Tories, for example, any of their plans about migration, any of their plans about migration. This is extremely worrying. So even though Brexit might actually have been negotiated within two years, Fact is, it might well be a long time before we get proper control of our borders, which is basically that we have got to be the backbone of Brexit. And that is exactly what we've got to be. In particular, I would say we have got to retain and absolutely never stop talking about the issue of migration. I don't know whether you saw today, ladies and gentlemen, in the uh, papers, but it's actually now estimated that our population is going to go up to about 70 million within the foreseeable future. I mean, not just like in the distant future. This is completely insane. Now, you heard from David Curtin this morning, the education spokesman. Well, David and I, were, we were elected to the London Assembly uh, last May. It's great for us to be on the assembly, but I think he'd agree that half of the... Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry, big mistake there. I'm not the deputy chairman. I am indeed the deputy leader, or at least I was before lunchtime. So I... <laughs> I'm sorry, there's been so many you changes saw? today. You weren't supposed to be mine. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I'm terribly sorry this morning, as you uh, might have heard, I, ha I was delayed by the uh, train journey. So I believe that the great Flo Lewis stood in and did. we swapped places and she spoke in my slot. So thank you very much, Flo. I'm sure it was great. Um, I will actually take you out on a proper date 
Uh, I don't think either of us is going to get very far with each other, but <laughs> always worth a try. Um, um, I've been doing quite a lot of media lately, and, and the thing that they're always asking is, what is the point of UKIP? What is the point of UKIP? Uh, we've heard this pretty much our whole recent history, haven't we? From the time when we originally managed to get Cameron to give us a referendum. Then it was, what's the point of UKIP? Um, and here we are, you know, two, three years later, and they're asking the same thing. They desperately want us to go, uh, but we're not actually going to go anywhere. Uh, and the fact is, is that if you look at what we are faced with in the coming two years or so, we are needed more than ever. And it's not a question just of flattering ourselves about that. Paul Nuttall, our great new leader, came up with a great phrase for it, which he used in studies.